Well, Jim Murphy, man, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I've told you this to your face. You are one of my favorite people I always run into at the matches. Uh, and I truly mean it. You, every time I see you, I get excited because number one, you are on my list of the top F-class shooters of all time. Just, you're always, you're so consistent. You're always in a good mood. Do you ever get mad? <laughs> <laughs> you ought to be talking to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, you're always in a good mood. You're always just up there. You're always solid shooter. So thank you so much for doing this. I know a lot of people are going to appreciate kind of getting an insight of, of uh, your mindset, your process, your background, all that good stuff. Because, you know, I'm trying to help grow the sport. And I think the best way is for them to, you know, talk to somebody like you or at least listen for or hear from somebody like you to see what you went through to get to where you're at. So that's my intro. <laughs> Okay. Well, Jim Murphy, tell me, how did how did it all start? Well, uh, how far back you want me to go? As far as you want to go, we got time. Uh, well, I guess it's uh, in high school where I was on in the ROTC and uh, I started shooting small bore. Well, I was in shot small bore for three years in high school. And uh, that's uh, the very beginning. And then uh, after high school, I didn't do much shooting after that. Got married, kids, and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, a friend of mine that I went to school with uh, got to talking to me in the early 80s about uh, going to Camp Perry. I never heard of Camp Perry. And... Uh, he uh, said, you ought to come up there and, 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 and shoot the matches and the nationals are, you know, I said, well, I, you know, I hadn't shot in a long time. And, I, and this was high power he was talking about. And I'd never shot high power before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I talked to my wife and so we, we went up there with them. The couples, there's four couples of us drove up and, uh, that's how I met Bob Depp mm -hmm. at Camp Perry. And mm -hmm. I know you know Bob. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we went through the small arms firing school and all that, you know. And and back course back then, everybody was shooting the M1As. You know, this is back way before elf class was even thought of, I guess. Uh -huh. So I that's when I started shooting high power, and I shot that all the way up to the oh, I guess uh, early two thousands. And mm -hmm. shot across the course and long range and all, you know, all this with the old sling and the coat stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, then F class come along and uh, I thought, well, now that's that's uh, a lot more comfortable because I don't have to wear that big old coat and mm -hmm. everything, you know. So I guess I started shooting F class about, uh, oh, about 2001, something like that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I, and I gave up and sold all my slings, uh, rifles, and, and all that stuff and just kept shooting F-Class. What was your first uh, rifle chambered in for F-Class? Uh, it was a 6.5284. Okay, so you got going with a 6.5284. Yeah. Um, That's what everybody, you know, was doing back then. Uh-huh. Sevens didn't come along until probably... Yeah, 2010. Started shooting something. the Seven Psalm. Probably 2006 or seven, something like that. Okay. So you uh, so you go to F-Class, just more comfortable, just, you know, less <laughs> less hot. Yeah. Well, that's not the only reason. Uh, of course, the older you get, you know, you don't know. You're not that old. <laughs> but your eyes get where you can't see those iron sights anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, that That's part of it, too. Okay. You just, you just were looking to... Pretty much the whole reason FCLA was invented, right, is to, is right. to uh, exactly. just facilitate shooting. Um, so, so you get into F class. Where where was your first F class match? Did you go straight into long range, or did you play around with mid range first? Um, trying to think back, I believe in the first match I shot, 
might have been down in River Bend, Georgia. It was a 600 yard match. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first long range was probably at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So did you just show up and just absolutely destroy the target or, or did, you, did it take <laughs> you a while to get good at it? Well, of course, back then we were still shooting on the regular, you know, the big target. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, you know, it, it was pretty easy to keep them in the 10 ring. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm not saying I never did miss the 10 ring by any means, but, uh, you know, it, it was a lot easier on the big target. Yeah, because uh, a 10 ring in the big target is a 9 ring on our regular target, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a big target. I, I, I still miss the 9 ring sometimes, though. <laughs> yeah. Don't we all? Yeah. yeah. So, so... You know, you start shooting F class, and now you're 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 just full throttle into F class. You sell everything else. Um, did you have any goals? Did you did you, or were you just out there trying to have fun? Well, uh, of course, at first it was it was fun. Uh, then they started having you know uh, the nationals. You know, the first nationals I believe was at Oak Ridge, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, and then after they started having bigger matches, then it got to, you know, taking it more seriously. You wanted to, you know, you don't know, you wanted to be in the top, you know, top five, top 10, if you possibly could, you know, mm -hmm. or win once in a while, if you could. So you, you got to be more serious and, and doing your loading a little bit better, you know, and all this new, uh, later on, and then all this new stuff come out, you know, better bullets and, or, you know, everybody was experimenting with different things and everybody was improving. And so it was, it, my goals, of course, like everybody's, is when you go to a match, I go to a match, I want to win, you know. And, uh, you know, everybody should have that in mind. Right. You go to a match, you want to win. Uh, you don't always do it, of course. I mean, there's always somebody there that's maybe a little bit better than you that day. And, you know, it might not be your day. Next time you go, it'd be your day. Right. That's one thing that a lot of shooters struggle with. They go to a match and they lose and they just think they're just not that good. And they don't realize it, it just wasn't your day yeah. or your week, you know. Because uh, you know what it's like. Sometimes you go to a match and it seems like you can't miss and everything seems easy and everybody else is struggling, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it works that way just about every match you go to. Right. There's always somebody that's on that day and everything's clicking for them. Right. And then you have those days once in a while. Right. And you just got to show up and make sure you're there when your make day sure is. Make sure you're there to do, do the best you can. And, and if it works out, great. So when I started, I started around 2008. And my first match ever was in 2020. And... and my first match out of Texas, because I've been just shooting club matches here at Bayou Rifle Club, and I didn't know anything. You know, I've been shooting at Bayou Rifle Club, and I thought, well, this is a club match, you know, and I just, I was getting destroyed every time. But, I, you know, I was just like, and, and I didn't want to leave Texas, because I'm like, this is a club match, and I'm getting destroyed every time, you know. I was shooting against uh, Mike Downey, Doug McIntosh, David Mann, Herb Edwards, David Bailey, uh, and I thought, you know, if I can't win a club match, well, then I realized, oh, wow, I'm shooting against all these heavy hitters that I didn't realize were heavy hitters, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my first match outside of Texas was uh, Raton Spirit of America 2010. And you probably, it's a memorable, very memorable match for me because that was the first one ever that I, I left Texas. Uh, and I know you remember that match too. <laughs> and I don't know if you, you want me to bring it up. <laughs> Do you remember what happened at that match? I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, obviously I didn't know who you were. I just know you were just destroying the field. I mean, you were just pulverizing everybody else. And, you know, and again, I'm, I'm what I call the big stage finally, you know, and I'm, I'm looking around and I see all these people like that I've only read about, you know, I see the, the Jim Murphy's and the Bob Bach and the Larry Bartholomew's and the, and the, uh, 
uh, Ballard was there because, you know, Ballard had been just lighting it on fire with the 284. And yeah. and I'm seeing all these people, you know, that I've read about and you are just destroying everybody. And <laughs> and so, you know, and of course, I'm I'm you have to understand where I'm at at that point. I'm I'm just the new guy that goes to his first big match. And uh, the last match of the competition. <laughs> Do you remember what happened? <laughs> I've been I, I'm trying to forget it, but yeah, I, I, know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, what happened? Like, what? What? You know, I've never. You know, like I said, I'm. I'm I've always seen it from the outside looking in, from yeah. the new guy, the first match ever, uh, and I've never had a chance to talk to you about this. So, what happened that day? Uh, like. Can you tell me from your perspective what happened and, and how you handled it and, and went on with it? <laughs> well, that's, uh, you're right. I was doing, I was shooting really good that week. And uh, the conditions for uh, Raton on that last match were pretty nice. I mean, uh, it's not, that's not normal for Raton. I mean, normally, the, in fact, from what I've heard from this year, it was really, really blowing. But anyway, it was a really nice day. I was ahead by several points. And, uh, you know, all I had to do was just, you know, not make any stupid mistakes. Well, I was laying there in prep time. And uh, I don't know, it, and this can happen if you got you, and it, I hate to admit it, but it, it'll, it'll happen to everybody eventually. I was just laying there in prep time, you know, and I think, boy, I mean, conditions are nice, you know. Uh, why isn't anybody shooting? You know, and I had, uh, I just, the mental lapse, I thought they had said, you know, the line was hot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just laying there and, you know, nobody was doing anything, you know. I thought, well, heck, I'm going to start shooting. So I fired a shot. Of course, I shot it in prep time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's 10 points you lost right there. Right. Of course, I wasn't 10 points ahead of everybody either. <laughs> right. So so, so, what goes through your mind right after that happens? Because, I mean, the whole hell comes down on you, right? The minute you take that oh, shot, yeah, yeah. it just cease fire. Yeah. It's just... Yeah. So yeah. what's going through your head at this point? You immediately know, obviously, what you did after the after it happened. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it did it, it, it did upset me upset me a little bit because I was made that stupid mistake. You know, mm -hmm. I thought, well, you you dummy, you know. So I thought, well, you know, that's that's gone. Don't worry about it, you know. And so I think after that, if I remember right, I only dropped one more point after that. Mm-hmm. So I had, so I had a, a what, a 189 out of 200. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in third place after all. Yeah. Again, that, that's if what. I, if I had have let it really upset me, you know, I'd have just, you no know, telling what would have. I'd have been out of the top five probably easy. But so, I, I didn't, I, I just for a little bit, it upset me. And then I thought, oh, I'll just calm down and, and go on and finish out. Um, I was talking to John Whitten yesterday, and uh, the same thing came up where he, he says, you know, oftentimes we, we we do something stupid or something happens, and now now we have a now we have an excuse to just throw it all away. Yeah, and it's almost you almost throw it away more than you need to just to emphasize how big of a excuse you have. You know, the bigger you throw it away, he goes, but that's. That doesn't help you at all. It doesn't help anybody. You know, the 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 real the real thing is to put it out of your mind, and then just pretend it never happened, and then just go on with your day like like normal, like you did that day. So yeah, you still placed third. Uh, I know you would have won. I think Biggs won it that year, um, if I remember correctly, uh, which was you know one of your teammates. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just I just never. Obviously, I never wanted to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, it, you're not the only one that's brought it up over the years. <laughs> well, it, it, like I said, the, the, okay. the main thing is uh, I had the conversation with John Whitten yesterday about 
when things happen, you know. So just so happened that, you know, I was uh, going to talk to you today. And, and then I remembered my first match ever outside of Texas. And it just happened to be that one where, where you shot in prep time. Uh, and how you just overcame that and you just went on with your day and just tore it up after that. Yeah. Uh, yeah from now on, though, I will tell you, I, I'm, I'm never the first shooter. That's a, that's a rule that I developed, and it may have been because of you. Uh, <laughs> it's like there's there's oftentimes uh, a lot of guys that just want to be the first one to shoot. They just that's their thing, you know. They just they want to be the first one. And after I saw what you did, see, you have to understand, it's not that you did it; it's who you are that did it. You are one of the most experienced shooters. Like I said, I believe you're one of the best shooters in F class. And if it happened to you, it kind of really hits home with me going, wait a minute, if Jim did it, I can certainly do it. So I needed to put precautions in place for me to not do that. So I'm never, I never shoot first, um, you know, and it's worked out over the years, but you know, even then it's, 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 uh, Cause you know how it is. You you lay down there and it's hot and it's you're just trying to get it over with and and then you, at some point you don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was just a mental lapse for me, and uh, you know you learn from your mistakes. Correct. So, Team Burger, um, I, you know, again that's another thing that I noticed that time. Cause the reason I went to Raton is because uh, a friend of mine, Mark Farr, he said, "Hey, we're gonna have a team and." You know, why don't you come shoot with us? I said, all right. And that's, that's why I went. And uh, <laughs> Team Burger was going to win. And everybody else was at best shooting for second place. You know what I mean? You guys were just dominating everything. And, and so how did Team Burger come to be? Well, uh, of course, Larry organized it. Mm -hmm. He's the one that got us, uh, you know, sponsors and and. and He's the one that contacted all all the different members and you know just get us going. So uh, uh, that's how it came to be. It was Larry's uh, mm -hmm. idea, mm -hmm. and uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked to be on it, and uh, I accepted real you know right away. So uh, and we we did have some really good uh, uh, competitions, and all of us you, you had good guns you know, at the time and everything. That's the main thing about a team ever. All your team members have to have a good gun. If one of them's kind of off, then that might hurt you in the long run. But uh, we all, we had, we had, we were fortunate to be, uh, to do what we did over the years. So when you guys started the team, because you know how F-class is, it's an individual sport. And all of a sudden you're on a team and you want the team to win. Mm -hmm. And you you have to have four strong guns, but if you don't, then the 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 logical thing to do is to help that guy or that shooter mm -hmm. that has the weak gun. Well, you're also once the team matches are over, you're also helping technically your enemy, right? Yeah. Are you guys? Uh, did you guys from the get go decide? You know what? It's we're an open book. We're on a team now. We're gonna we're gonna just share everything. Or did you guys kind of still we're on a team, but kind of held your cards close to your chest per se? No, no, we didn't. Uh, we we shared everything. We were on the phone with each other a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, we tested a lot of stuff. You know, different loads, different barrels, everything. We we shared everything. There wasn't any anything held back at all. And uh, of course, that that does help a lot, you know. And we got uh, we had really good response test, and we'd give them feedback on it in the early days, you know, with, especially with Burger and Bartline barrels. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of testing for Burger bullets, and they would send us samples and stuff to test, and mm -hmm. each one of us, and we'd give them feedback on how they did and what we thought need to be changed or whatever and that that helped us a lot right um did you notice that sharing all that information with each other not only helped the let's just say the weakest member but it helped the entire team overall 
to become oh, better? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I don't think any of it, I'm, well, I, I don't think, I know, none of us really cared, you know, if one of our team members won and we didn't, you know, that was fine. You know, we were there obviously competing with each other and individuals, but uh, we were rooting for any one of us to win. It didn't matter who. Well, um, as you know, our team is doing pretty well. Uh, oh, yeah. It's done well over the years. And people have asked me that, and I said, no, we share everything. I mean, absolutely everything. And uh, and the same question comes up, and I said, you know, I said, I look at it different. I don't look at it as me losing. I look at it as me having seven chances to win, because as long as one of my teammates wins, I, I'm excited. I'm happy. You know what I mean? So the last, what, three matches, Burger and both nationals have been my teammates you know jay christopherson pat scully and now todd hendricks and i mean i feel like i won the nationals even though i didn't but you know it, it's it's just uh it's just very rewarding to have a teammate win because you know they know what i know pretty much because we share everything so that just that just tells me i'm due any time any day you know what i mean yeah, we were, you know, I think every one of us on the original burger team, for sure, have won a nationals. And, uh, and now that, uh, and even Danny, he came on a little later, he won the FTR nationals one year. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and so, you know, that was, that was rewarding to us too, that, that every one of us had won a nationals over, over a period of time. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the, as you know, we're a fairly young team and we're starting to, the team members starting to get national championships. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which yeah. is, uh, it's, it's a nice journey to be on because like I said, none of us had national championships, you know, and now back to back, Pat Scully, Todd Hendricks, and Jay won the Southwest National, so I mean that's a that's about yeah. as. So yes. now we have three members. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, oh four, because uh, uh, Seabolt has won the Southwest Nationals twice. Mm -hmm. So you know that's four out of the seven that have won a national title. I mean I've won the mid range national championship, the the just the burger match, but mm -hmm. we don't count the mid range. <laughs> 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 uh, so that's a, that's a good question. Let me get your input on that. Uh, Mid-range versus long-range. Um, I know the U.S. team doesn't recognize mid-range as, as an achievement of any kind because you have to have long-range qualifications to join the team. Mid-range, they don't care about. Uh, what, what's it like in your, in your, in your view, the mid-range? Is, is, it, is it valid for any kind? Any, uh, What's your take on the mid-range nationals or just mid-range matches, not the nationals, just mid-range matches. Is that something that you like to shoot or, or you avoid them or what, what's your take on that? Well, I don't say I avoid them. No. Um, I think they're good for, uh, for testing for sure. Um, you know, when I, when I, when I go out to Phoenix and spend the winter, they shoot some mid-range matches out there and uh uh they shoot you know of course they have their state championship and they have regionals and stuff like that and and i usually shoot all of those uh, obviously in my opinion mid-range is easier the, of course you're you know 400 yards closer and so your the wind is not as drastic mm -hmm. but uh it is good for testing and i but I, I don't shoot them as much as I like shooting long range. You know, um, it, the mid range target, you know, it's a controversial issue, I guess. Uh, it seems like now that, that everybody, all, every, all the equipment's so improved, uh, it's not, not unusual, you know, shoot 600s in a, you know, in a match you know, three matches, shoot 600, you know. So I don't know if the target needs to be smaller or, or what, but, you know. 
that's an issue sometimes comes up, you know, in, in conversations around the range. So that's the issue that I have with 600. Uh, to win, a, the target is easy, but the competition isn't, right? So to win a 600-yard match, you have to have a really good rifle because you're going to have to win it on X's. You know, right. these guys are shooting over 50 X's, you know, right. uh, which means you're going to have to bring your, you know, your good long range rifle. You, you can't just bring your backup and say, you know what, I'm just going to shoot that with my backup because it's probably not going to cut it. Right. So you need to bring your really good rifle, which means you're going to burn up better life shooting right. a mid range match. You know, now don't get me wrong. It's I think it's tough, very tough. Like I said, it's it's but. Uh, it's just, if you're not shooting clean with a pile of X's, you're just not going to have a chance. You know, these guys are just, just, um, I, I used to shoot mid range only for the purpose of learning how to shoot X's because, uh, I, I kind of got away from shooting X's for a while. I started getting on the 10 to win X's don't matter train. And then I went to Phoenix in 2010 for the long range, no, the Palma Championship, three days. And I, after three days, I lost by one X. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to learn how to shoot X's again. And uh, Steve, Stephen Blair, he's the one that told me that, you know, mid-range teaches you how to shoot X's. And I said, you know what, that's right, because you always focus on the X. You know, where at long range, sometimes you focus on the 10. But at mid-range, you always focus on the on the X. And it it... it, it you know, after doing that, that, that was my only purpose of shooting mid-range, and my X count went up. Uh, do you, when you're shooting long-range, or let's just talk about long-range, are you trying to shoot tans or are you trying to shoot Xs? Well, I'm trying to shoot Xs, Austin. I really am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, do you because, believe that... Like you say... It's getting so tough. The competition's getting so tough now that uh, X's are coming into play at long range. Yeah, I think I think the uh, just this match that they had in uh, Red Tone uh, this weekend, you know, this week, whatever, it was won by like one or two X's. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's it, and it, you know in Red Tone where it's real windy. You know, yeah. Um, yeah um, so you're you're an X shooter. You you go for the for that X. You know, there's a lot of there's there's still that debate comes up where X's don't matter, tens win, X's don't matter. But you know, well, bring up another point. Uh, I started shooting in the last several years, uh, small bore F class, mm -hmm. and uh, X's really come into play there because uh, I won the nationals a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But they have a really big match out in Phoenix called the Wildcats. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a four day F class and sling small bore match. Okay. And uh, this past April, they have it in April every year, and I lost that match by one X. Four days of shooting. Wow. Yeah. You don't tell me X's don't matter. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you that, but I, you know, some people say that. Uh, yeah, I, 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 like I said, I used to think that at the beginning, and then after, you know, it, it takes shooting for three days and losing by one X to say, you know what, hell with this, I'm gonna go shoot X's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your uh, your tuning procedure? Do you do you are you uh, do you like to tune at long range or you tune at short range like I do? What what, what do you do? Well, I'm a little handicapped on that because uh, I don't have any long range places to shoot practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've only got a hundred yard range within probably 200 miles of me. And uh, that's all I got. So that's where I tune. And, uh, you know, I would like to have a little further, probably, you know, 300 maybe. I don't know. I think it would be a little better, maybe, but you, you know you have to use what you have, and uh, that's all I've got. So that's where I where I do. Now I don't when I go to a match, and I I hardly ever 
just a tuner at a match. Right, I'm the same way. Um, so, do you? Uh, what is your? Uh, what are you looking for at a hundred yards group size to make you say, you know, I got a good one here? Well, first question. I'm gonna let me let me ask you a question before that. So, let's say you have a rifle that shoots half inch at a hundred yards. What do you do? I'd rather take... do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying because I always tell people that in F class. If the rifle shoots half a moe, it's it's at a hundred yards. It's time to pull off that barrel, you know. And, and and some of them they think I'm crazy for saying that, but so anyway, what are you looking for at a hundred yards? I'm looking for well, if you if you're going for group size, I'm looking for quarter inch or under. Or right, well. Yeah. It's hard to get under a quarter inch for me, anyway. I, mm -hmm. I hardly ever get one under a mm -hmm. quarter inch. You talking about five or ten shots? Well, I'm I'm trying to figure out what you what you do. You know what what satisfies you to say you know what this is I'm I'm done. This is this is ready to go. Yeah. Well, I try ten shots. Okay. Ten shot group. Quarter inch. Quarter inch. Okay. Now, I don't always get that. I mean, I. I don't know if you always get it on yours or not, but uh, and I don't. But if I don't, if I get a three eighths, I'll go to a match with a three eighths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But half inch is no go. Half inch, I, I I don't like to. I may go to a club match or something, but uh, if I don't have anything else ready or something, but I don't want to go to a big match with that. Do you? Are you tuning uh, for low extreme spread, or, or are you just looking for group size? Uh, mainly group size. Well, I want a decent extreme spread, but I'm not looking for single digits mm -hmm. always. No, I, I don't really think that is a big factor. You know, and I may be wrong, but I, you know, I, I'll go to a match if I can get a good group size and still have in the teens. It doesn't bother me. Did you happen to see that group that I shot at a thousand yards, inch and a quarter, five shots? Uh, no. So, so I shot a five shot group, and I just happened to be had my cameras going, and uh, on an electronic target, four shots were in a quarter of an inch. They were stacked on top of each other at a thousand yards, and the fifth shot opened it up to about a, I think, inch and a quarter. Uh, five shots, thousand yards, but the extreme spread on that was nineteen. Yeah. And I thought, well, <laughs> I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know I don't think extreme spread is that critical. I mean, you don't want fifty or something like that. But, uh, I, it, it's it's kind of odd. You think, you know, I've shot groups that were, I would call, almost one hole, at a hundred yards, mm -hmm. of course. and extreme spread might be twenty five. And I think, you know, you know, I, I, it doesn't make sense. Well, I would say, when in doubt, believe the target because. There's, there's, the chronograph is not a hundred percent accurate, you know, yeah. Yeah. and it, what's accurate is the target. If, right. If you put a tiny group on the target, that's what it is, and that's ultimately what we care about, right? Right. I don't care. I mean, if if I have an ES of a hundred, but I'm getting at a thousand yards, just consistent X-ring, vertical, always. I don't care. You know what yeah. I mean? Because that's ultimately what I'm going for. And I don't think these uh, electronic targets give you an accurate SD or whatever. Oh, no. I, I, don't, I mean, the, the, I don't think that anything about it is as accurate at all. No, I just. And I'm not saying the target itself doesn't show you an accurate shot, but I'm saying those numbers that come up are not even close. No, I mean, it's it's just, the, the, at least the one I have, the it's about eight inches or so that the, the microphones are apart from each other. And it's just a acoustic microphone, and, and it picks up the the shot, you know. And of course, there's echo. I don't trust it at all. I, I just go off of the the lab radar, and even that, I take it with a grain of salt, you know. I'm mainly looking for, I don't know, something that's not totally crazy, like you said, you know. Over 20, I start to kind of wonder if I can make it better. But yeah. if I'm in the below 20 for extreme spread. I don't Another care. point, I don't know if you were going to ask about any loading or whatever, but uh, I did, uh, let's see, uh, went to, I went to Oak Ridge a couple of weeks ago, shot mm -hmm. their uh, 
state championship. And uh, I had some ammunition that I'd loaded with uh, uh, real heavy neck tension. And then I had some that were fairly light. I mean, I, I don't know how to relate light to heavy to you, but when, on, when I was seeding the bullets. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, I'm going to take this and during ciders or whatever, or I'm going to experiment to see what difference it makes. It made no difference whatsoever. So now I know a lot of people won't believe that. Well, so this is why I like these conversations, right? Because like what you just said right there, when I sort ammo, I have this very fancy press and everything that, that, that traces everything. Uh, and everything that seems odd, or let's just say my, because it measures PSI, right? And most of my ammo is between 30 to 40 PSI. So about 10 PSI mm -hmm. difference. And every now and then I'll get one that's 60. Yeah. And I'll move that one to the front. I said, well, this is going to be a Fowler because I don't want to shoot 60 right next to the 30 to 40, right? Right. And then I keep loading and I keep seating and then, you know, I'll get another one that's 65. Okay, well, this one goes over here in the front. Well, then I'll go to a match and I start with the ones in the front, which are the 60s and 70s and whatever, just to kind of start getting on target and, you know, use my ciders. And then at some point where I'm centered up pretty well and I'm, I'm, I want to start my string, I always like to shoot at least, at least one cider, maybe two, with the ammo that I'm going to shoot my string with, right? Yeah. And when I switch from the really heavy neck tension to the light neck tension, I'm like, okay, let's see where this is going to end up, right? Because it's about 20 to 30 PSI different. It yeah. goes right in the X. And I'm like... Okay. Okay, am I wasting my time doing this? <laughs> exactly, because I shot the, I shot the heavy ones, at first. I had five X's in a row in ciders, and I went to the others, and I shot another four in a row with the others. You know, mm -hmm. I thought, well, you know, why am I doing all this? <laughs> well, I think at the end of the day, uh, it still makes me feel better, makes me feel more confident. <laughs> And as you know, that, that carries a lot of weight in competition to, right. to, to okay. not have to worry about anything. But I, I, have, I have seen that multiple times, but even though I've seen it, I'm still not willing to not do it. You know what I mean? Well, I, I know. I, and I'm probably going to keep, I'd like you say, when I see one and it's a little off, I'll put it over, you know, for a warmer, bear warmer. Or, right. You know, I'll, I'll probably end up still doing that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. So, so you shoot a psalm still? You still shooting your seven psalm? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever get on the 284 train? I do. I, I have a 284, and I've shot it, uh, but I haven't shot it at a thousand very often at all. So that's I've, your mid range rifle. I just shoot the psalm at a thousand. I'll shoot the 284 to 600 yard match or something, but I haven't shot the the 284 at a thousand. Oh, maybe. I'd say maybe over three times in my life. Why did you get on the psalm? Well, this was back, like I say, probably about 2006 or seven, I think. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I uh, you know, when we came back from uh, South Africa in 2005, we were all shooting 65284. Well, the South Africans were shooting uh, a seven millimeter of, uh, I don't remember exactly what cartridge case they were using, but mm -hmm. it was, uh, it wasn't a 284. It was something a little bit bigger. And, uh, and you know, they did well with it. They beat us. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we, everybody got to talk about sevens, you know, and, and I got to looking around and I, Remington had come out with this earlier about i think about 2002 when they came out with that part mm -hmm. and uh, i was reading a magazine and there was there was an article on that and, and i thought well that looks like it might be a pretty good case you know something for f class so i ordered a bunch of brass and a reamer and uh, i thought well i want to be a little different than just a standard song mm -hmm. so i ordered my ringer with an improved 
shoulder. So okay. it's a problem with it, you know, improve. And uh, I started shooting that probably, like I say, about 2006 or seven. What's and improved about it? Just the, the shoulder. 40, shoulder. 40 degree, okay. And it already has, a, I think, a 30. 30, 30, 30 I think. 30, uh -huh. I think. yeah. Which was fine too. I mean, I didn't, it didn't, I don't think that really improved the accuracy of the cartridge in A or whatever, but I just wanted something different. You should have went 38 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> no, I went 40. Could have went 45, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, and I did well with it over the years, you know, and uh, then, uh, of course, the two eight. A lot of people started shooting two eighty fours then too, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then, and I think a lot of people now uh, are starting to shoot the psalm that had never shot it before. There's more psalms out there now than there ever was. I think. I think the uh, well, you know, it it takes a little getting beat by one to to one one. You know what I mean? I mean, you guys, <laughs> do you shoot one? Big shoots one too, right, Danny? Yes, he does. But okay. now, Danny, he's, he, he does have a psalm. Uh, he shoots his Shahane mostly. Yeah. Uh, well, he kind of goes back and forth, but I think majority of the matches he goes to, he shoots his uh, Shahane. You know what I think is going to be a good one? And there are so, already some out there. It's a 6.5 PRC necked up to 7 millimeter. Yeah. I think that's, especially with Lapua, is going to make brass for it. Yeah. I think that's going to be a good one. Yeah, I, I, I've looked at that myself. I'm not going to do it because I, at my point of life, I'm not going to go into anything different right now. Yeah. But that would be it. You're right. That would be a good one. Now, um, you used to be a machinist. Was that your day job? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did that transition? I started, I was, actually, I I'm a, started out, I was, I'm a tool and die maker. I went apprenticeship and all that through and, and got uh, and a tool and die maker. And then... Uh, that job, I worked as a tool and die maker for several years, and uh, then I got to looking around for a better paying job, and it seems like a machinist paid more than a tool and die maker, so I went into a, hmm. another business that was uh, called me a machinist instead of a tool and die maker, so it's about the same thing. What were you making, tools and dice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I assume you chamber your own barrels? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I've done that for even before I got into elf class. How did how how do you think that has helped your success? Do you think has it has any benefits or? Oh, you, definitely has benefits. A lot of benefits. I mean, if I want to do something different, I don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. You know, I can you know, I, and and I've been around machines and 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 uh, in a little engineering and you know i can come up with ideas some of my ideas work some don't just like everybody's but you know i can i can go out there in the shop and, and do it and uh, that, that's a big advantage because you know people that don't do their own barrel work uh well it costs them more money obviously but uh they have to wait and then if it's not then if it, it doesn't you know most good gunsmiths and i underline good you know that you'll get a good product from them every time mm -hmm. sometimes you you know depends on who you go to and how to all that you know you think well you, you know this this one didn't work very well so i could try somebody else and i mean you gotta if you you don't have to do your own work to be competitive obviously right but it helps it makes it easier so that's what I did back in uh, when I decided I was going to get really serious about this. I'm like, I'm going to have to do my own barrel work. That just, for me, that's just one of the things that I decided I was going to do. Yeah. And uh, I bought a lathe and started learning. But I never chambered a barrel. Uh, you know, I, I read all about it. And I, I, I saw videos. I, I just learned all about it. But I was like, I'm not going to chamber one until I learn from somebody that really knows what they're doing. Cause you know, I can learn bad habits or whatever. So anyway, I decided I'm gonna call Speedy and have him teach me how to chamber barrel. And that's what I did. 
That was a good teacher. And you know what? Since my first barrel, it shot great because I, I did it just like Speedy taught me. You know what I mean? And there was a lot of things. Somebody like Speedy, and I'm sure somebody like you that, that has the background of machining, and, and you guys are going to do things differently than you're not just going to chamber a barrel. You're going to chamber a match winning barrel. You know, there's there's a difference. Yeah. So, okay, so let's talk about your your rim fire deal. How, how did that, it, how do you like that compared to center fire? <laughs> I really like it. Uh, I do. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, the only, there's good points to it. You don't have to load ammo. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> but you have to find ammo that shoots good in your gun because you don't have any way to change it. So Tuner. He's a tuner. Well, that's the only way, yeah. Right. Uh, of course, you can put different twist barrels and, and, and stuff like that, but your ammo is locked into what you got, I mean. Right. And... Uh, that's that's a uh, main advantage is you don't have to reload your barrel life is forever <laughs> you can get well i say you know to be uh, to shoot you know in now now in, in rim fire elf class if you don't have a gun that shoots oh i'd say almost one hole every you know a 10 shot group you better have a gun that shoots eighth, one eighth, or you're what, not going. To what distance? At fifty meters. Fifty meters. Now, right. F class rimfire shoots fifty meters and a hundred yards. Uh, we're not into that extreme long range or anything. Yeah, but still, hundred yards with a. How big is the target at hundred yards? The uh, X ring. You shoot the uh, international metric target uh -huh. at hundred yards. And uh, the 10 ring is, uh, I think it's around 0.985, something like that. Just a hair under an inch. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there is no X ring, but you get an X if you're in inside the line. If you don't touch the, the 10 ring line. That's oh, okay. An X. So if you, if you clip the line, that's a 10. If you, if you, Completely clear inside. That's an X. It's an X. Yeah. Oh, and there's now, no target pull, sound, right? No target pull. That sounds like it'd be pretty easy to do at 100 yards. But uh, you know, the wind pushes that little 22, and it don't. You don't have to have hardly any wind at all to push that little 22 bullet at 100 yards. But now at 50 meters, you're shooting at it, and this target does have an X ray. Now, I, I can't give you an exact dimension of the X-ray, but it's probably oh uh, maybe an eighth of an inch. Yeah. Do do you guys uh, do you guys set up flags like the benchers guys would do? No, there is flag. There, we call them flags, but they're you've never been to a small flag. No, never. Okay, they put out at uh, I think it's at 50 yards, whether maybe at 25, at 50, at 75. It's a, on a, on a, it's about, oh, maybe two feet high off the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's got a little wire sticking up at a 90 degrees and it's got a piece of surveyor's tape about maybe a foot long. Okay. And that's the only wind flags you got. You don't have the bench rest type okay. wind flags. Okay. What kind of equipment do you use, rifle-wise? Now, that that is the uh, expensive part. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. I like high power. Uh, same expense, you know, barrels are about the same price, actions. You know, everybody uses custom actions just about in the up class. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, you know, they'll run anywhere from like, you know, twelve to fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars just for an action, single mm -hmm. shot. So you're not you don't save any money on equipment by shooting small bolt. What uh what action do you use? Well, I I have uh, two Swindlehursts which were made by Kelby's years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, 
they don't make them. They have made them in years, but uh, they're one of the top actions out there. Hard to find now because they quit making them probably oh, 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a new one come out. And I've got one of those now that I built uh, this year. And it's really showing really good promise. It's a uh, voodoo. Yeah, the single shot. Single shot. I have their repeater uh, action. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're they're not cheap. <laughs> no, they're not cheap. <laughs> and I mean, they use the same triggers like like your regular rifle, you know, your right. high-powered rifle. So. Right, right. Well, that sounds like something I want to try. <laughs> yeah, it, you ought to try it. You'd like it. You'd yeah. Like it. You can use your front rest that you use now, your rear bag. You can't use a one-piece rest. That's a different discipline. There is another uh, rimfire thing that I shoot called ARA, mm-hmm. American Rimfire Association. They shoot off a bench, like bench rest, mm-hmm. and they got flags, and they shoot 50 yards, and they got a different target altogether. You shoot one shot, in, uh, and there's uh, 25 bulls, and you shoot one shot in each one. And if you hit the, the center, it's 100 points for each target. But it's it's a difficult target too. Well, yeah, I can imagine. All right, before I let you go, we have to talk about the 2017 World Championship. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Obviously, that's that that was the last championship we've had. But how is a World Championship different than a national championship? And how? You know, how was your performance? How do you feel your performance was then? 2017. Uh, so how was my performance? I mean, were you satisfied? Do you wish you had done better, or were you? Well, you always wish you do better. I right. mean, I'm just <laughs> yeah. Smart. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I was happy with the way I placed. You know, fourth. Mm-hmm. That's the second World Championships that I placed fourth in. The, first, wow. the one in South Africa in 2005, I was fourth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, you know, fourth is better than fifth. I, I know. I know. I had to bring that up because you brought that other thing up. <laughs> yeah, right. Right now we're even. Uh, but... Here's here's about my uh, my world championship. You know, I, I ended up fifth. You were fourth, and I was again. You know, you were one of my old time idols, and to have you standing right next to me, that was great. But on the way home, you know, it's always a long drive home, especially from Canada. Three days it took me to get home, oh. and uh, I, you know, you always wonder what could I have done better, you know. And Rod Davies, he, he I looked at the scores. He got me by like eight points or something silly like that, you know. Which means you got me by you got me by two points. He just walked away with it, and I was like, you know what? There was really nothing I could have done better. It's just it's just a lot of points. Is there something that that stands out that you say, you know what? If I had done this better or that or. Well, yeah, uh, and and this happens to me a lot. It's. I guess it's just the way I am or whatever. When I go to a match, usually I start off a little slow, I guess you'd call it, or or I don't start off most of the time with the best scores. Like even when I won the nationals at Lodi, mm-hmm. that was, then I, I don't know if you were there that year or not. I don't no. remember. That was 2011. Right, I wasn't. Okay. Well, we, we were still shooting 600 then, 600, and then a thousand, and they combined them. Uh huh. Well, at 600, I shot awful. I mean, I was. I don't remember exactly what place I was in, but I was probably down around 30th place. Wow. Center yard. Wow. I mean, and it wasn't just one or two points difference between first and 30th. Right. Thought, well, you know, I'm out of this. But I got to thinking, well, you know, just keep shooting, you know. And so when we got back to shooting thousands, 
that's when I came up. And and uh, uh, me and Don Nagel were pretty close going into the last match of the thousand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I ended up beating him by two or three points. And I ended up winning the Nationals. And I've done that in the past. Well, even there at Canada in 2017, the first day or two, you know, I was down in the pack. You know, I wasn't 30th or something, but I was down there, you know, I don't remember exactly, but I was down below. Maybe I wasn't even in the top 10, I don't think, after mm -hmm. the first day or two. Mm -hmm. But you got to just keep going. And that's, I don't know why I do that, but I do. It seems like when I go to a match the first day, especially if it's a four day match or whatever, or even maybe even a two day match, you know, I don't shoot my best scores the first day. But I try to hang in there and, you know, do the best I can to come back. So I did the best I could in, in Canada. I mean, Granted, we were, you know, like you say, I was probably what five or six points out of first, and uh, I lost that. I lost those in the first two days. Yeah, well, the first day we shot one time, and then we got rained out. And second day is where same same for me. Uh, I just just kept leaking, you know, just leaking points, leaking points. You know what I mean? And then uh, the third day is when I, where I literally made the call because I was 19th. I remember because I looked in the morning and said, okay, I'm 19th place. 19th or 30th doesn't matter. So I'm just going to go for it. You know, I'm just going to make really bold calls. And, and I did. And uh, I ended up winning the day. I, got, I won the aggregate on day three. But, you know, that, that got me up to fifth place. Mm -hmm. But there's always the, what if I had done that on day two? You know? Yeah. And I fell behind. You know, day one... We only shot one, and I think I was the high score. It was just at 700 meters. I was the high score, and then second day, I just I struggled. I, I had I had a hard time, and day three, I finally had had it in me and 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 won the aggregate. But you know, day two cost me too many points. You know. Yeah. Well, the last day we shot, uh, like well, I was squatted with Bramley. Mm-hmm. And we were on the very last target on the right. And everybody said, oh, you don't ever want to be over there. Well, I shot my best score right there. <laughs> that's the easy that, target. That sort of bumped me right up, right up <laughs> in the court. Why did, you, why did you drop on the last one? That seemed to be the one that moved everybody around. The very last match of the, of the World Championship. I only think I dropped two... I think it was two points on the very last day. That was the, like I said, that was the one that that did it for most, you know. Uh, the last one either made you or broke you. Because, you know, you know how it is. You still got to stay within striking distance. But it only yeah. takes one relay where, where it's really tough. And it just, it just reshuffles the whole field. And uh, there was a lot of shooters that were doing really good. And another thing that... I didn't realize, but they didn't re-squat us based on, they didn't do seat squatting in Canada. They just, for example, the guys that were uh, on day two, they were ahead of the pack. They didn't squat them together the next day. They were just on different relays, which I don't, I don't agree with. I think you should be shooting in the same conditions, but they didn't well, do that. I, I agree with you. I think it, seat squatting is, is, a, is a fair way to do it. Yeah. But the last relay, uh, I shot, I wasn't the last relay. I think I was relay one in, well, it would, I would have been one. Uh, so I shot before the end of the day. But the guy, some of those guys, like Todd Hendricks, he shot the very last one of the day. Just the very last one. And that one, I think they were all tough. And obviously I didn't shoot in that, for, but the scores were pretty bad in, in that one string. So I, I'm I'm willing to just based on the scores. Todd Hendricks was like second place or third going into the last one. And then he got he got bumped all the way to tenth place after that one string. Uh, I don't know. It's just as you know in F class it's, it's the luck of the draw as well. But when they don't when they don't see each squad, eh, it's kinda there's always that what if, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
and uh, I don't remember for sure what's what uh, relay I was on uh, on that last match. It wasn't the very last one, I don't think, but it might have. I don't know how many they, how many different ones they shot that day. If it was just two or three, but I don't. I wasn't the first one either, so I must have been. They must have shot to three, so I was on the second one, and then. Of course, you know, they were, back then, they were uh, concerned at that range on the velocity and your bullet weight, and you had to be within a certain uh, muzzle velocity group. Right. So I was on the very last point on the right, and when I got through shooting, they caught, they said, well, you got to go down here and get your ammo tested. Uh -huh. so I had to go all the way down to the very first point on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> all the way across. <laughs> so, but anyway, that that wasn't that bad. So, uh, I, I was kind of surprised that uh, they pulled me off the line to do that. But yeah, well, they did that to me as well uh, on day two. All right, Jim. So, new shooters, what would you say to them? You better have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, no, just uh, you know, just like you said, find somebody uh, if you can close to you that that shoots. Go with them, you know, and they can teach you, get you started the right way, and uh, get you, you know, so you won't buy a lot of stuff or do a lot of things that that you don't need to do, and get you started off on the right foot. That's uh, that's an important thing to do. Go to a match if if you can, you know, before you ever start. If you want, to, if you think you want to get into F class shooting, you know, go to a match. Go to two or three matches, and you know, talk to people, look at the stuff, see what's going on, you know, and uh, get into it the right way instead of buying something that that's not going to work for you in the first place. That's where a lot of money comes in because if you don't get good equipment. I mean, you can go and have fun if that's all you want to do, but you're not going to win if you don't have good equipment and good loading skills. And then once you have those, then you can start learning, you know, technique and and uh, and wind reading. And the wind reading course is ninety percent of it anymore. Right. That's that's what separates the big boys. Yeah, I'd say ninety percent. I think that having a good gun is a high percentage too. But well, can a can a good shooter can a good wind reader win with a bad gun? How bad's bad? Well, I'm bad. <laughs> something that's considered bad. Uh, not very often. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's possible because when you're leaking nines, top and bottom, it doesn't matter how good you read the wind. No, no, no. Now, yeah, yeah a good yeah. If you're if you're if you're a good wind reader and you're not leaking up and down. You know, you may be able to keep them in the nine rank, some somewhat. But if, once you start licking them up and down, you don't have nothing. You, you're you're gone then. It's over. It's over. <laughs> and I've uh, had a few them days too. <laughs> oh, I think we've all had them, and that's just one of those days, right, where just things are. And you know what it's like, right? Especially Burger Nationals when you go shoot 800 yards, the first target of the day, you go shoot 800, and and then. You take either you leak some out or you, or you take up the entire ten ring at eight hundred yards and you're like, oh, this is gonna suck. Yeah, because <laughs> it's only gonna get worse. worse <laughs> yeah, but you know that that has happened. But sometimes it you kind of settle down when you get going back too. You know. Yeah, it, a lot of it is the shooter just just nervous. You know, do you still get nervous when you go to big matches? Mm, not very often. Uh, no. I can't say that I, I I have you know a few taps, but not very often. No, no, no. I've been doing it so long. It, uh, I mean, so when you're ahead of the pack and and you know there's one match left, it doesn't bother you at all. Like you just treat it like anything else. Well, I guess in that situation, you know. Uh, in the last several years, I haven't been in that situation. <laughs> That's one way to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that could probably uh, 
if I started thinking about it much, which I you should you shouldn't do. You just get down there and do what you can do, but try to get get that out of your mind. Right. Well, which is the hard part. Like I said, I talked to John Witten about it, and he's like, you know, that's that's what gets you. It's you are your own worst enemy. You know. Yeah. But, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I have been in situations where, you know, you'd be ahead, you know, and uh, uh, I remember one particular one. This was out there at, at uh, I don't know if it was one of the nationals in Phoenix or one of the Southwest nationals, but uh, I was ahead. Uh, I wasn't ahead in the match, but I was I was doing pretty good in the match. But of course, Larry and I a lot of times and even Danny, we, we kind of if we're not you know, head in the match, we kind of try to get the grand senior trophy, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was ahead of it, all of them in the grand senior thing by probably three or four or five points, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I blew it in the last match, you know. So you, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can blow it even if it's not for the win, if it's for something else, you know, if you're trying, well, I'll just try to beat them for grand senior, you know. But, yeah. You, know, you, you got to stay on your toes. Well, that's that's another interesting thing. So, because in F class, right, even if you're not winning, you're like, well, at least I'll see if I can make top ten. And then if you if you have a bad string, you're like, all right, now I'm gonna see if I can make top twenty, or see if I can win the grand senior, or yeah. see if I can just beat this guy. You know, at some point, you just keep re re uh, restructuring your goals. Um, like, like at the nationals this year, when you and I were squatted together, and I thought, man, man you know, he, he's he, He's a tough shooter. I, if I can beat him, that'll be an accomplishment because I wasn't in the running for the Nationals, but I, you beat me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, V2 finale. What did you think about that? I liked it. I, I didn't do well in it, but mm -hmm. I, I did like the, like the format, and uh, I enjoyed shooting in it. And uh, Now, I was going to uh, Dead Zero this weekend, but mm -hmm. uh, some things came up and I couldn't go. That's a point match for the V2. Mm -hmm. uh, but Danny's going to be there. But, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll get an, Even the last one, I really didn't try to get points. I mean, I, I just didn't. I got in it because some some people, you know, didn't couldn't go or something. And I was on the list to come up. Mm -hmm. But uh, I may try to get points this time. But yeah, I, did, I liked it. I, the only thing that, uh, and I think they had a lot of discussion on this, uh, the 15 shot string. I was thinking maybe that was a little bit too much, but I think it worked out anyway. But. Yeah, we're kicking around the idea of uh, minimizing to 10, uh, but not all of them. Maybe the first day still keep it at 15, just so that, because you know, a lot of people get eliminated on day one, and yeah. we don't want it to go shoot 20 shots and they're out. So we want them to shoot more, you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're still kicking around a lot of ideas. I don't know what's going to end up happening, but we, we are taking that into account for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, those matches, they, they, they get tough and they, they go quick. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, that, 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 I enjoyed that, even though I did. I got eliminated first day. I did. So, uh, but I got to shoot against the top top shooters are right off the bat <laughs> yeah you went against jay first right jay christopherson yeah. and and i beat him on the first match yeah like, oh wait i got <laughs> I, might, I might be doing something here and then uh it went downhill from there <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened to me i i got i went up against uh brian blake and yeah. uh i shot and i got him uh, on the first one, I thought, oh, because I got him by a lot. Like his gun wasn't very good, and I yeah. thought, and and mine wasn't either. But uh, I thought, well, this is going to be at least I'm going to get past this, right? Well, then he gets up and goes and gets another gun, and I only had one gun. <laughs> his other gun was much better, so he ended up getting me, and then I had to go against. Uh, uh, they call him Coco. You may know who he is. Uh, Kokoska, mm -hmm. I think his last name. Um, so anyway, with Brian Blake, we went to three, and then against Coco, we went to three as well, and a shoot off. So and he got me, he got me. Uh, you know when you have your bookends and you go, you know, uh, my shot has never went past left two, 
-hmm. it's always been downhill of of left too so uh the wind picked up and i was in the shoot off and i thought you know what i'm gonna hold left two because i know it's gonna go downwind mm -hmm. and he had hit a five and i thought you know what i'll clip a five if it's if i'm wrong i might catch an x and then mm -hmm. i then i win or a v right so i held left two and it went upwind <laughs> and i was out oh i've done that too yeah yeah well even against jay it went three matches and he got me, and then I had to shoot against Gosnell, and it went three matches. <laughs> so, you know. Well, you got a lot of shooting in. Well, then, then Danny and I, he got eliminated the first day, too. So we went to Oak Ridge and shot the regional that weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Oh, there you go. I come in second there, so I thought, oh, same gun, same ammo. <laughs> what you do? Well, you know, the, the heavy hitters were at the, at the V2. Well, Some well except for Danny. Yeah. Oh, did he Danny win? I, well, a couple of, a couple of uh, Texas boys came up there. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's his I, name? Think, I think Johnny Ingram went down there. Yeah, he won it. Oh, Johnny won it? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Well, he he beat Johnny. me by a couple points, I think. Wow. Yeah, Johnny's a good shooter. You know, it's one of yeah. them one of them Bayou guys that are, yeah. you know, Bayou yeah. has developed some really good shooters. Lonzo was there. Omar, yeah. At the Oak Ridge. And, um, oh, I have a hard time with names anymore, but uh, another guy, the, the pilot from Texas, the flies. Tim, Tim Vaught. Tim Vaught, he was there. Yeah. They, they just came the second day, though. They didn't shoot the first day. Yeah, they, okay. they got eliminated on day two at the V2 finale. It was, it was a tough match. I mean, you know, it's, it's a oh, lot yeah. of heavy hitters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jim, thank you so much for doing this. I, it was fun. I thought it was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you asking me to do this. All right. Enjoy talking to you. All, All right, right, Jim. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.